going over the topic of old worlds and what the hell Hoyo wants to do with them, I want to talk about this right here. The reason History Channel was the bomb back then on cable TV. Pyramids. Nope, not aliens, not just yet. We'll talk about that in a different video. First, pyramids. Now, there hasn't been any sandy area in Genshin this prominent. And it looks like that since when has that been on Teyvat? And why do we not know about this before? I mean, it's just the fact that Hoyo's world building is kind of a spinning wheel, but come on. That thing, everyone has to know about it or have seen it and talked about it at least. I'll give Hoyo a pass for not mentioning something this huge in the land of wisdom. But my rants aside, there's something about about Hoyo's presentation of all this from the teasers that is hiding something really big in regards to the knowledge about the past, the present, and the future of Genshin. This is gonna be a dive into what Sumeru might be hiding deep within the corridors of the desert, specifically that thing, which I'll call either the First Pyramid or Mount Meru, which hides the key to the sky and is the location of the king's apartment, which is related to that thing there that the Torah is burning and what I want to call the Body Tree or more known as the Tree of Awakening. These things which are called the Akasha, as well as being able to dream in a land where people don't dream. What the people of the desert are keeping away from the eyes of outsiders, Sino wearing the clothing of Anubis, which is the god of death and afterlife, and finally the god of justice and the previous Dendro Archon as well as the possibility of Otto being in the king's apartment or end up as Horus, which was said to be the god of the sky, which canonically also contains the sun and moon hidden underneath the Pyramid of Djoser, or Mount Meru. Whew, we're in for a wild ride guys, so bear with me. I've put everything in order so you can follow along without messing out on any of the important information that I'm about to say, so sadly no timestamps, just listen to ya boy Aru. Let's start with this pyramid here, as well as this underground ruin, which I think is some form of amalgamation of Mount Meru and the Pyramid of Djoser. Mount Meru is, in short, an hourglass-shaped mountain located at the center of the world, quote-unquote. It's also worth mentioning that Mount Meru, or Sumeru, is the prime location where the sun and moon revolve around. This is believed by multiple religions such as Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism. Now, what is Mount Meru on top of? To me, that is a set of ruins inspired by Egyptian architecture. This is a nod to the trench network located around the vicinity of the Pyramid of Djoser, which by the way is the first pyramid ever constructed. The layout however of all the structures around the pyramid fits the Pyramid of Unas better, but the trench underneath it I think fits the Pyramid of Djoser more. It's just a little opinion. And underneath this first pyramid is the Great Trench which surrounds the entirety of the Djoser Pyramid or, in Genshin's case, Mount Meru. Much like Djoser's underground necropolis, the underground ruins under this hourglass pyramid is vast and wide, as we have seen in Sumeru's teasers. What's more interesting is that Hoyo took every bit of the necropolis under Djoser and virtually put it under Mount Meru. The entry hall, the entrance corridor, the colonnades, and possibly a room leading to the king's apartment where the tomb of a pharaoh is located, which is possibly how Sumeru's story ends. Because the whole point of making a pyramid is none other than to bury a pharaoh or the king of that empire. We'll go over that in the end. For now, we move closer to Sumeru's overgrown region where a huge artificial looking wall is seen. This wall, I can only guess, is a nod to the walls of Jericho which either surround the desert biome or the overgrown biome of Sumeru. From history, the main objective of the wall was to keep the people or city inside it from being penetrated. But in Genshin's case, I think it's to keep something from leaving. Again, we'll talk about this at the end. But moving into Sumeru City itself, we can see the people of Sumeru wearing a gamer headset called Akasha, which if translated literally means sky, space, or aether from Indian cosmology, whichever religion you prefer. But the same premise is consistent. It refers to the word sky. And what is this hourglass pyramid doodly doo doing? It is sucking up the sky. I swear, Hoyo, why does no one talk about this? this thing right here. But my headcanon theory is that the pyramid is either being hidden or kept away from the eyes of the outside world, and the god of wisdom is using these so-called akasha to keep people from spreading it. Or on a lighter note type of theory, the akasha is used to store data, similar to the akashic records. And the god of wisdom is using the sky as something the tree can feed on to store those memories. Now, the akashic records in short are where every event, memory, theory, lore, literally everything, and everyone's knowledge is stored. So keeping it 
set in a big tree for the god of wisdom to feed on or keep records at least is a very handy tool, but it leaves some questionable acts hidden behind it. Remember when the devs mentioned that the people of Sumeru don't dream? Well, they also take pride in not being able to dream as well, saying that it symbolizes their rationality and wisdom. But to me, it's kind of a conflicting statement because if people don't dream, then they aren't able to think beyond themselves. Anyone who doesn't dream of anything or to dream of dreaming isn't in themselves given freedom to think of whatever they please. A word from Dane's Leaf is that there are those who dream of dreaming. To Sumeru and its people, not being able to dream is a sign of wisdom. Yet to those hiding from the gods, there are those who dream of dreaming. A theory that the Akasha meaning sky is being fed to the people of Sumeru by means of that big tree in exchange for dreams or information seems kind of inhumane, considering the fact that Scaramouche mentions that the sky is a lie. Then would the god of wisdom be feeding on people's dreams and replacing it with lies taken from the sky? Uh terrifying but also wild to say the least. And let's not forget that the god of wisdom is not the same as the Dendro Archon. The god of woods was the previous Dendro Archon and the god of wisdom today allows what we call erudition and folly as mentioned time and time again. But why not let them dream? Dreaming is essential to finding knowledge and allows the freedom to think of the wildest theories. So why can't they dream? Well, so far we've yet to know what happens in the future, but a small working theory of mine has to do with the Fatui, specifically Dottore. Remember that burning tree that Dottore was up to? Well, that tree is what I would like to call the Tree of Awakening, which sounds more or less too good to be true. The Tree of Awakening is where Gautama Buddha attained enlightenment after seven weeks of meditation. So could the Tori be burning this huge tree to allow the people of Sumeru to dream and break the cycle of lies fed by the God of Wisdom? If you're listening up to this point, you might think that this is too wild and too crazy of a theory. Well, let me tell you something. It's easier to say that since the Fatui are bad guys, they want to destroy the years of enlightenment and knowledge built upon by the people of Sumeru, right? It's easier to blame the bad guys, of course. But Scaramouche, and therefore the entire Fatui, or at least the Harbingers, know that the sky is a lie. And maybe they're up to something even crazier than just ruin the land of wisdom's body tree. Remember, to every Fatui member, checkmate does not end the game. Destroying one civilization's prized possession doesn't end that civilization, and I think that's what the Fertui are after. If ruining one chessboard means they can make the next chessboard have better odds at winning, then maybe what Dottore is doing, even though it looks like folly in its greatest, it's still done for a better endpoint of all chess games. Burning the Tree of Awakening could mean that everyone in Sumeru can dream again, but it could also mean that burning the Tree of Awakening might basically erase all of Sumeru is precious data and mind force, as I like to call it, essentially brainwashing the people of Sumeru in the process. Because remember, that headset is connected to that tree. So what do you think is gonna happen if you burn that tree that's connected to the headset? It'd be no short than logging out from Sword Art Online. Another point is that Mount Meru is where the sun and moon revolve around. If this reflects Genshin's hourglass pyramid thing, then does the Fatui want to control the sun and moon too? If so, then why? If those theories or what might happen on the next story quest, i.e. destroy big tree equals Fatui can control the sun and moon, as well as everyone can dream, but will have the side effect of losing their accumulated knowledge and possibility of brainwashing the people of Sumeru, then the entire story of Sumeru is an amalgamation of crimes against humanity, and therefore crimes against the Geneva Convention. But we are not done yet. There is still one question to go over. What are the Eremites? hiding in the desert. Firstly, the Eremites are what can be summed up as nomads from an ancient civilization. In real life, the word Eremites are commonly known as hermits, which are people who live solely for the purpose of a secluded prayer life. Think of monks of the Genshin world. But these Eremites are also working as mercenaries, so it's a mix of both nomad and monk in the Genshin context. But the desert where the Pyramid of Djoser or Mount Meru or whatever you call it, as well as the Great Trench is all under the Eremites protection and that they possess knowledge to use untold legacies of that ancient civilization. And that knowledge, as well as whatever power they were hiding, can be used as a deterrent 
in times of crisis, quote-unquote deterrent. So the question now leads to, what can the Eremites do that would be so impactful that the devs themselves have to mention it as a point of hype for Sumeru? Remember Sino? Yeah, well he knows how to exercise demonic entities that come from raw elemental energies. Compared to ghostly possessions and exorcising the people of Liwe, I think that he's a bit higher than Chang Yun and Shen He's capabilities, not to mention his vast knowledge as the General Mahamatra, meaning officer of high rank, with their full name being Dama Mahamatra, or in kind of simpler terms, inspectors of the universal laws. They were apparently a class of senior officials who were in charge of various aspects of administration and justice, along with his entire aesthetic resembling the statues of what looked like the Egyptian god Anubis, which was the god of death. But even though Anubis is the god of death, his most important role was to keep evil out of Egypt. So Anubis isn't really a bad god per se, he has more similarities to what you would call the fairy man in Greek mythology. But something interesting about the ruins under underneath Mount Meru is that the statues depict more of a hawk looking character than a dog or a jackal, which points us to the god Horus. However, there are statues that depict the god of death Anubis, which is the inspiration of Sino's clothing and design, which I will talk about on a different video, but first I want to talk about Horus, which represent the sky, sun, and moon, meaning power and healing respectively, which goes back to Mount Meru, which the sun and moon revolves around. And let's not forget the book before the sun and moon, when the primordial one landed on whatever Teyvat was called before Teyvat, and basically created all the humans. Remember Nahida? Well, she's the Risa Apocalypse from Honkai. There's no arguing about it. Something funny and wild about the name Nahida is that when you put her name into things like numerology, horoscopes, and signs is that her numerology number is 1 and the runic planet that presides over the name Nahida is the sun, along with her clone name from Honkai, A310, all being under the healing season and the season of new beginnings. Along with some more Honkai lore, Kalan's clone, Teresa Apocalypse, was a mix of Kalan's and Vishnu's DNA. And Vishnu was an Emperor-class Honkai beast with accelerated regeneration capabilities. Not only that, it is also classed as the Vipralopa class, which was a Honkai beast that was only known in the previous era. This was all according to Cosma, one of the 13 Flame Chasers. The main reason it was called a Vipralopa class Honkai was due to a technicality regarding its unique ability to absorb the power of Honkai beasts it consumes. Now think about Nahida and Teresa Apocalypse. Coincidence? Uh, we'll think of it as no. But for now, let's use the name Nahida as a relation to the sun. And what else is related to the sun? Well, Horus's right eye is related to the sun. But the right eye represents power and quintessence. And that Horus's left eye is the one that represents healing. But the eye that represents healing is also the same eye that represents the moon, which isn't Teresa Apocalypse. Stick with me here because this is gonna be a bit more crazier than usual. First, let's clean up the fact that this is the eye of Ra and not the eye of Horus. But both Ra and Horus are birds, which, if put into Genshin, could equate to putting them together as one god. Now, I chose Horus specifically because Horus has depictions of having both eyes of the sun and moon, namely, Heru Ur or Herwur, which was Horus the Elder, compared to Ra, who only has the sun on his right eye. Even if I'm wrong about Ra, the point still stands that Horus has both eyes of the sun and moon. Now, back to Teresa being the sun, even though she is supposed to be the moon, her original battle suit in Honkai was Valkyrie Pledge, which is all about throwing out the sun or holy magic or holy light or lightning onto her enemies. Along with that, Teresa Apocalypse has something that was from Kalen originally. She inherited Kalen's weapon, the Oath of Judah, which dispenses holy light or in our case, the sun. And another thing is that Teresa is a biological clone of Kalen, hence the name A310. We also have Teresa's battle suits being the starlit astrologos, which is the closest thing we could find to the lesser lord Kusanali. And that, you know, it's kinda green, it's kinda support-ish, it's kinda healing, but yeah, you get what I mean. 
So if we just reverse the two, Nahida or Teresa being the moon, which was about healing, and theoretically put Kalen as the sun, representing power and quintessence, then we have both of Horus's eyes restored to full. Then who's Horus? Well, there's a name that both Kalen and Teresa is related to, and that's none other than Otto Apocalypse. I'm not gonna say that this theory is good, but if Teresa is the right eye and theoretically Kalen is the left, then that would mean that there's something inside of the king's apartment. And maybe Otto himself is in fact Horus, which is the king in the actual tomb. It's too good to be true and if you're an Otto best girl simp then you would probably be jumping on your shoes. But it's still too vague to tell, until Hoyo says something mildly close to Kalen or Otto. Now, why would someone be under the pyramid? Well, that's just that. Pyramids are tombs. And what better tomb for a king to be inside in than a pyramid? But this raises the question, what would a king in a pyramid have to do with that thing happening up there and this tree being burned? Well, it could possibly be because the Fatui are trying to either burn the tree of awakening, which could be connected to the sky being sucked in as a means to feed the people of Sumeru or as a means to keep the king's apartment blocked off. And destroying that tree means you can destroy a some sort of barrier keeping the king inside the king's apartment from waking up. If not that, then burning the body tree or attempting to burn it might spark the god of wisdom to do something related to that hourglass sucking the sky, and therefore releasing something that the Eremites only use for so-called times of crisis. Which if you put the puzzle pieces together, that tree burning and their knowledge being lost if that tree burns is a time of crisis. Unless of course these two areas are a whole different storyline. Am I making sense here? The tree of awakening, the sun and moon, the sky is a lie and dreamers? Hell, maybe the person in the king's apartment is the dreamer of dreams that Dane is talking about. <sighs> All that I've mentioned so far presents a new way for Hoyo to tell their story regarding what happened more than 6,000 years ago as well as 500 years ago way back in the Cataclysm. And it is also a way for Hoyo to give an entirely new story about the Honkai verse and, well, Genshin verse. But of course, mad theorists are mad for a reason, I guess. If you find this theory or theory dump, I guess, helpful, then leave a like and share it with your friends. If you want to find more about the old world as well as theories on the other regions, subscribe to my channel and check out more of my videos. Comment below what you guys think of this branching set of theories of mine and what you think of the Sumeru teasers as a whole. And of course, to keep you guys from straying from my madness, you can watch more of my videos here. And with that, I'll see you in the next video, yeah? Bye!